<laughs> we're, we're here to talk about uh, so what? Uh, how do you how do you get how do you take a company and, and get it to a place where you know in this world where it seems like everybody's starting a company, like they're handing out companies at like Safeway when you walk out of them, and and. Um, uh, and, and so when you start a company, how do you kind of raise above the noise and, and how do you use something like a brand uh, in order to do that? And so we have a panel of experts and then a dumb shit VC um, here to talk about that. Um, I'm going to talk, I want, the, I, want the, uh, I want everybody to introduce yourself just in a matter of like a tweak. And if you go to like to the 141st character, I'm going to cut you off. Okay. Um, so, so we've got uh, uh, Mark Silva here from, uh, uh, from Anthem. Can you tell a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, we're a digital marketing arm of uh, Anthem Worldwide that uh, represents big CPG companies like uh, Pepsi, Unilever, Darwin Restaurants. Great. Awesome. And, awesome. Uh, awesome. I'm just kidding. No, I was going to you. No, no, no. no. I was gonna, you, you only get one. Uh, and Mike Parker from uh, Tribal. Yeah, Mike Parker, president of Tribal DDB, which is a digital advertising agency, uh, born in Vancouver, living in San Francisco, uh, worked with a lot of big brands to help them use digital channels. Excellent. And Michael Duda, uh, managing partner of Gibson Uh Founder company with Steve Nash. We're BC marketing oriented, uh, advertising agency guys working with startups like Birchbox to establish companies like Underarm. Uh, and I'm Rob Hayes from First Round Capital, where Steve stage investing. Uh, uh, nationwide, I should say uh, continent-wide. Uh, so uh, one thing before we start, I just want to say we've got an audience full of Canadians, obviously. And um, every time I come to Canada, I'm, I'm reminded of how, <laughs> how nice everybody is. I mean, it's, it's crazy. And so um, I tend to be a little vulgar. And my challenge to you is on this panel, without Dave McClure on it, I want each of you to drop an F bomb at some point. <laughs> OK. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, so off we go. Um, so let's talk about just real quickly. What is a brand? So, so Mike, what is a brand, and what does that mean? I think, uh, particularly with this crowd in the audience, when you start talking about branding, I think the natural inclination people have is to think about advertising and spending money and, and creating your your brand. I think for for us, um, at its most basic state, a brand is a promise. What is the promise that you make to your customers? What does your business stand for? And uh, I think you know, one of the first things that people need to do when they start a business, a product, a company, is identify um, you know, what, what do they stand for and, and what promise are they going to make to their customers. OK. So um, uh, Michael, take that, take that one step further. What, describe what, the, what, what does it mean to build a promise? Sure. Yeah. The promise has got to be the very soul of the company and the product. And I think a lot of people think branding is like, what does your logo look like or senior company? Those are things that come out of like a brand promise. Um, what it takes is just what business you're in. What makes you the only blank to do blank? And so many ideas we see in startups, they're great product ideas or something that are techno technologically driven. But what, what's going to make you stand out versus something else? You know, a lot of the goofy kind of advertising guy exercises we do include, like, if you had to describe a person using brands, what would they look like? So if I were going to say, I don't know the relevance being in um, media, but uh, if I were to start a person saying Sam Adams beer, Timberland, Volkswagen, you get a sense of like what that person looks like and everything along those lines. So it seems a little bit very, very goofy and everything like that, but it's the very soul of what separates you. And, and, and Mike perfectly said it's a promise that you keep that can really help you as you launch future products um, and loyalize your fan base and your customers. And it's all about serving the customers and the business around. You know, I called my uh, last agency Real Branding because a lot of people thought the brand was the corporate identity, and we felt like if you're, if, all you have to do is look at a tweet stream, 80% of activity around a brand is not that at all. It's actually owned by the consumer. It's, so it's, it's everything in the hearts and minds of consumers, and even beyond a promise, because again, if you think about it, if you just take that shift beyond what the client, what the, what the brand says going out, um, it's how people adopt it, how people put it in their minds and hearts, and so it's the uh, sum totality of what everybody thinks and believes about your brand. Some days that's great, and some days you need to do hard work to, to, to develop it, but I think digital and, and, and that mobile and social is at the core of what the brand is. For the people in the room, I, I, I wanted to, you, you mentioned Sam Adams, he used to do a lot of uh, product testing where you would take a look at all the brands that were out there and say to consumers, which of these beer packages is most authentic, and you'd have that. He's a Canadian brand, Molson, 
Budweiser, Sierra Nevada. Everybody would point at Sierra Nevada. Sierra Nevada hadn't changed in 20 years. And they screwed it up. They fucked it up perfectly the first time. Score. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, and, and what I wanted to say to any of the entrepreneurs in, in the room is um, that belief, that passion that you're putting into it for the first six, 10, 25 employees, you probably have it perfectly, perfect, just, as, just right uh, the way it should be right now. I, I look at Instagram, I look at Twitter, I look at you know, the, the things that they put around their brand to express their brand. Um, and it was absolutely right and perfect the first time. And it's probably going to screw up as agencies and other VPs of marketing come in and try to reinterpret what was in the hearts and minds of the, 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 start, the startup guys. But I think branding actually is the last thing you need to worry about as an entrepreneur to start at the early stage because you, you probably already have it right. So just as an aside, I think that uh, panels and conferences tend to sometimes be a little dry. And so, so my intention here is to make sure that all three of these guys leave the stage totally fucking pissed off at each other. So, so, uh, so, 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 so Michael, so, 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 so Michael, is, is, you are, is Mark full of shit or not? Um, yes. <laughs> 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 Fuck yes! <laughs> Fuck yes! Fuck yes! Fuck yes! It's like, Q Mark. You know, is he, a, you is he in an agency? No. I'll disagree a little bit just because you want me to, but it's just because if the brand does well, it's going to send a signal to your employees for what products are you about. Everything along those lines. So it just it kind of goes back again to what the definition of a brand is. The brand should be a, a promise, it's a set of values, it's like what business we're in. And so like company, Apple, what, what person doesn't start that company with that? And when you listen to Brian McKee, there's no doubt that he's already got a brand in mind and a promise there. It's, you can't attract your first seven employees if you don't already have that. So I'm saying spending effort on this activity called branding is probably not where I would spend most of my time. Well. It should be, to your point, it should be more organic. It should be some, if you're a CEO, if you're doing a startup, you should be a leader and have some sort of vision for yourself. So don't disagree, but there's a lot of startups that don't make it off the ground either. The one, thing, great I, the one thing I would just say, Mark, to what you said was, um, you know, inherently, if you're a CEO and you have an idea and you're starting a business and you are that brand, the brand is you and the idea that you have in your head. But I think, you know, we're, we're all trying to build businesses and you can follow the money. Where's the market opportunity? Well, should I do that? Or should I start an ad network? Maybe I should be this. And I think if, if you express the brand as like, really what are we trying to do here and use that as a filter, um, a brand is also what you're not. And a brand can help you understand maybe what businesses you shouldn't get into. Uh, what's not right or complementary to what you're trying to build, and I think I think you're right. Like you don't need expensive agency guys like us to help you in the first few weeks of your company when all that's in your, in your mind. But I think it's important, even when you're at the earliest stages as a startup, to to articulate that, to put that down, to have an understanding of that, and make sure that your employees in the marketplace understands that too, so you can use that. It, it, so you said actually you said something interesting there. Wanna, so so you said at the earliest stages of the company, and yet I think building a brand, I always thought it, was, it can be expensive. So, you know, just explain to a, a company here that's, you know, got on a little bit of money, they've got a pocket full of loonies, and, and, and they, they, you know, they need to figure out where to spend that money. How are they gonna spend it? What, what part of that should they spend on building a brand? And how much, how much should they, in it? how much will it be? So, I, I think some of the process Mike was talking about, and there are plenty of books on this stuff that you, you can check out. The what you stand for and what you don't stand for is, is really important to articulate. I think it's great stuff to do. Um, I'd say that you know McClure's got a pretty good point because it's not here about how UX and design is such an essential part of the world today. Um, it's probably one of your core first hires, and so where, where I would put it is really in those core first hires. Um, I wouldn't spend a lot of brain cycles on um, the what are we going to do when we grow up. I would be, be you know trying to. Burn as much of that earth as you can, scorch as much of that earth as you can, building out your vision. Um, I do think that, that that human interface part of it, the designer, the design UX, even if you're doing something for the SaaS or the enterprise, is absolutely essential to, uh, to to expressing that passion that you have that this is going to change the world. You hear that? Completely agree with that. I speak in more analogies and dumb stories and everything. So, the first box, which was our first investment back in September last year. We just had a great announcement today. They had three people at the time. And literally they had more money they could do with in terms of take it from investors. We were lucky that they chose us because we could buy them in brand and marketing. And it's not to be like, let's go do an ad with this. We force them to make sure the customer experience is paying off what they want to do. 
which is to be disruptive to the beauty and cosmetics industry and be like a wonderfully discovery mechanism. So the power of the Birchbox brand, uh, I'm just going to pin that up, is they actually have embedded brand management and content into the product itself. Their first hire, their junior founder, is Molly Chen from Kanye West Traveler. So they use YouTube channels. They show women how to use makeup. They show how to apply the stuff, what they should do and not do. They curate these boxes once a month for, for women to get, and they will put stuff in there that they don't believe in. That's brand. Well, that's cool. You're talking about brand as a service, not as, a, as an artifact or as a, as, a, as, a, as a thing, as a product, right? But it, it starts with what, what promise they're building a promise to another 45,000 subscribers and what's in there, what's not in there. And, and are they perfect? No. It's like we're about to don't do advertising, don't do this. We want to know what customers want to, to model and keep serving them. So is that branding? It's probably not what some traditional definition would be, but if we do our jobs right, we can help Birchbox them and to spend more money on advertising and branding for a longer period of time. Well, the greatest brands today, right, as of today, in the last five years, uh, haven't, haven't been built through that traditional advertising model. They've really been built by having a kick-ass product that has enormous utility. Yeah. So and that's one of the things being true to the experience. Well, Google's a great example. I mean, that's, Facebook's a great example. You can't say that it was a it was an advertising campaign that said Facebook connected all your friends. Uh, that 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 got people to convert. They had so much value and utility. You can say the same thing about anything that's taken. No, I think you, these guys are absolutely right. Like experience at the heart of your brand. And I think coming back to your question, um, you know, I think it's also a question of scale, right? So you start off at a certain point. You're true to your promise. You have a great customer experience. You have a great product at the heart of it. You're the CEO, you're the founding team, you're evangelist, you can tell your story. But what happens after you have 10 customers, and 100 customers, and 1,000 customers, and you're going international, and you can't be the guy in the pitch all the time. And you need to have people out there, a sales force, materials, a website, you need to be able to tell your story, you need to have a logo. So I don't think you know brand activities are things that you need to spend a lot of early cycles on, but as you're growing to become more important as part of the process to scale your business, to tell your story. You know, how, how do you convey what you do? And I think one of, the, one of my greatest frustrations, we buy a lot of services from, from uh, a lot of the companies in this room that we bring to the table for our clients as this mark. And you know, you know, people come into, into my office and pitch me uh, for a new social media platform, a new opportunity, some new software, and can't really articulate what they do or what problem that they solve or you hear about a great company hear about you know brian's company keep and i go on the website or whatever to check it out and you know half the time you, you read the description of what the company does and you, you can't understand it doesn't matter all you need to do is talk to brian and you're buying right yeah. <laughs> there's the there's the passion of the the entrepreneur right so, but to, to to me uh being clear about what you do and how you articulate that in a way that can can really connect with your consumer like that's the next level how you scale yeah, you know, when you go from that, that 7 to 10 to 25 employees where you're probably never going to have per capita the most output and productivity and that kind of mind melt that you have um, when, you're, when you're there. The, I think the greatest skill, and you mentioned Sam Adams, I think Jim Cook, it took him 20 years to have someone who could actually extract his vision out of his head because it was so complex, so beautiful, so passionate about what, what he, he was changing the world, right? He's the largest American brewer right now. As a matter of fact, I mean, considering he just got bought by a Belgian uh, company, so there's a guy who it took years for him to execute his vision, and it took years for people to extract his vision out of him. So I agree with you, that process of taking that vision, that founding um, vision, and turning that into a communication structure—that is the art and the, the science of branding. That is something that you do when you're down the road. Well, uh, so so if we're going to pick on Brian a little bit, and I'm happy to do that, um, uh, let's let's talk a little bit about his domain. One of the things here, you know, I, I always look at it and I'm like, kid, it, it, it. Um, and but it's key, right? And and so so, how important is that one piece of it when you're? I mean, and one of the examples I have is a company I was involved with a few years ago called Mint.com, right? Yeah. And they started out as Mind Mint, and we spent a lot of time trying to say, okay, let's actually make it Mint because that makes more sense. How important is is domain name in, in terms of building the brand? When all you can get today is, you know, all, all I can all I can afford is this shitty domain name. Uh, how how is, how is work? Well, I, I think I think Rose by any name actually uh -huh. in this particular case. Um, I, obviously, when you got money to throw around, and you can you can buy the .dot me or the .dot co or .dot com. Um, that's absolutely awesome, great. Uh, but I'm like o .dot com. Hey, someone can actually bought the one letter. You know, Overstock got big enough that we can buy the one letter domain. Um, I, again, I, I think that when you think about all the other problems you, you have to face. Um, get the name 
to still that value prop is important. You probably already have it from the moment you start this thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think keeps a bad name. Um, let me give you one other, just to shift a little bit. We talked a little bit about what you were asking a little bit about other brands. Zappos is a great example of a brand that was built from its core. It was built by the kind of people that they hired. It was built by a spirit of service and philosophy. You know, and what does Zappos mean? Well, it means shoes, right? Mm -hmm. But it, well, it's, it's an abbreviation for shoes in Spanish, right? But it's but it. So you kind of go, well, that's kind of a crappy name. Well, it's probably an easy domain name to get. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, you had a company to build. Mm -hmm. And you built an amazing company, an amazing culture that was worth 800 <laughs> million X or something like that. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Anyway, it was right? <laughs> but, it was, but, but, but through the strength of that, focusing on that one part of his brand, he killed it. I, I don't think... I mean, you, you can spend a lot of time thinking about what's the perfect name for your company and what's the perfect domain name and what's the perfect logo and all these things. But at the end of the day, those things come with no meaning in them and you create the meaning. This is to Mark's point. Like Zappos to most people didn't mean anything and they had to create that. You know, the swoosh is a stylized check mark until Nike made it, you know, mean something. So I think the as long as it's not overly complicated or cumbersome or becomes a barrier to understanding your brand or to the experience, I don't think it matters that much. Let me, let me give you one, one uh, build on that. What if you actually come up with a name that could be a verb, though? So if you, if, if you can hear your name being, think, I just got keeped or I, got, I just got Googled or I got Facebooked or whatever, you know, when, when your name can become a, a, a verb, that, that's pretty powerful because that means you've just shifted from something in the mind and perceptual framework to something in the heart of it. So is there anything to be learned? I mean, so when, when I think of brands, I think of like old old time brands, right? I think you know. So is there anything to be learned from what how how brands were built a hundred years ago? I mean, totally. from from totally. the experience of you know you know Kleenex, Kleenex. How did Kleenex become Kleenex or, or Tide or, or Skittles, right? I mean, how I mean, what 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 can we learn from from those old guys before there was social media? Michael. And there's a lot of that says brand management 101 that still takes place today. And what business you in, what do you want to do, what customers you want to attract. And back to the name thing, you can make a purpose behind any name. I mean, as long as it's not too silly. If you said, I'm going to build a great law firm that's going to be very prestigious, I'm going to call it like clownpenis.com. <laughs> I'm not going to bet on it. So well, there's an accessory right to it too, although I'd like to see that. That'd be actually good for any gunner season or anything. So it's a brand mental one in terms of what business you in, who do you want to serve, and, and, and go from there, and, and have it be strategic, have a positioning. Positioning should be something that more timeless in terms of what business you're in. Ad campaigns come and go, taglines come and go. But what is the positioning of your company? And it affects everything from what consumers you go to, but also when you are you know, hiring employee number 30 and you're the CEO founder and you can't interview that person. Whoever it is must extol the values of the company and everything and the culture. So brand sets worth even what the culture is going to be. It's all interlinked. Um, that's why great brands are the, the very first one. But a lot of the tactics being used in the past is the four P's of marketing, which are more push based. We're going to go trap you, consumer. Well, that's being blown up. And that's why the excitement is that's why there's 675 people in this room today. It's like all bets are off. Because I bet the people in the room here can innovate a lot more than Procter and Gamble can or Coca Cola can. And Coca Cola now has to go out and buy vitamin water for $4 billion. Google has to go buy that stuff. So it's a great time to start up from something from scratch. Let me, let me give a cautionary note on this. There's uh, uh, branding for a lot of people who don't understand the discipline of branding and, and the, the, the real, you talk about 60 years, I and mean, there's a body of thinking and work and structure around that that can still have, it still has a core uh, philosophy and discipline around it that does work. It does have to mold and adapt to the social and mobile world. But, but there's a lot of people who come in as salespeople and say, hey, we can help you with your branding. And branding for them becomes a euphemism for an unaccountable ad spin. And that's, that's, I just want to really caution you from that. Either both if someone's pitching you on doing a brand work for you, or if you're going to help, going to someone like Coca-Cola, probably one of the best known brands in the world, people come in there and say, hey, we can really help you with the brand. They're going, really? Really, I've got the number one brand in the world. How's this going to How's this going to play out, right? But there's a little bit of a, there. You got to understand that the, the, those people that you eventually want to sell to actually do understand what their brand means, the heart, the minds of the consumers, and how that relates to profitability and everything else. And there is a real structure to brand that that has to be respected. And and so, can, is there a lot to be learned? Absolutely. And in fact, I, you know, I, I think probably hire number 30 or somewhere down that road there, it'd be great to bring someone from CBG who has a great deal of that discipline in your actual core corporate structure. 
but yeah, I think yeah, that was yeah, the I mean, one thing. For, for me, when you look at, you know, we work for McDonald's and Intel and all these big brands, right? And they spend a lot of time and money and trying to win hearts and minds and, and compete in the marketplace. So how do you take from that and apply it to an early stage company? I think, you know, to your point, if you look back to the discipline of branding, what's important for me, and it, it kind of, it's interesting, you know, Brian and other people touched on this as a, going out and asking and spending a lot of time with your customers. And inherent in any good branding discipline, right, is developing insight, trying to really understand who your consumer is, what their what the problem is that you're trying to solve in their life, and, and why they should care about your product or your company. And I think, you know, I, I get, I meet with a lot of companies that come and, and seem like they have solutions but don't really know what problem they're solving. And I think that part about really understanding who your customer is, what their pain points are, and, and how you fit into that, and being able to explain that in a way that somebody's going to go, not only do I get that, but that's going to make my life better, easier, simpler, faster, or something. Um, and so this, this, this company, this brand makes a lot of sense for me. So I think that's one piece of the discipline process of branding that can apply. When you, uh, when you just use even the word insight, I think that's a really abused word. We have a really specific definition. It's got to have three parts. It's, it's about a deep and penetrating discovery. So it's not a dud, it's an aha. Uh -huh. um, about a need or motivation that could be unlocked for business growth. Each of those three areas have to be used, right? And, and the one thing I'd actually say is if you are going to sell the CPGs and you can unlock those for brands and the, the agencies and the clients, doors are wide open. So real insights about consumers that aren't obvious to to the brands, you're right, a lot of people come in with a solution, but they actually came in with insights as well, saying, hey, and, and, and again, because the social mobile web is look at, and looking at the real time, they're, they're seeing, seeing stuff, stuff that not, these guys, guys, guys aren't looking at. They're looking at 2010 data to inform 2011 planning that will do 2012 execution, right? So, so the more that you can bring real insights to the partners and the agencies and the, the CPG companies, um, my guess is the door is wide open for you. And again, brand is, we're talking about big consumer cases, like Under Armour, we just got, we just cost a billion dollars in revenues last year. Our brand mission Under Armour is to make all athletes better. That's it. And sometimes it takes like months, if not longer than that, to figure out what's that one phrase you can describe the company and doing in the soul. Everything we do is predicated, how do, is this something that makes all athletes better? Um, first round capital, which maybe has 12 people, is a brand in the space. Think about it, if you're entrepreneurs in here and you're raising money, it's like, do I get my money from like clown venture capital just to pick on the clown brand or first round capital? Ooh, first round capital invest in these guys. Ooh, they must be legit. We know that because when we were starting up our little fund about a year ago, first round, they hustled for us. They were giving great examples. They were, they were great. So I know what the first round capital brand is, which is like entrepreneurs that invest in entrepreneurs. And they live it when you see Finn Barnes hustling, Kent Goldman hustling, or anything like that. Not every VC is like that. So a brand could be, even if you're a startup, you think, well, we're not Target, we're not McDonald's, we're not Under Armour, just like, Brand is also an experience, and it's an ethos. And, and when you talk about the people who go into Coca-Cola about branding, and, and branding is like a Smurf in the cartoon. It's so overused. It can mean a logo, it can mean an ad, and everything like that. It's really comes down to the experience uh, as much as possible. Every touch point you have, uh, we have a big thing. You can say, Larry, I want someone. Someone calls us on the phone. Someone picks up that phone within one or two rings. Doesn't go to voice. Because we're part of the service or the culture. Today. Silly things like that is an articulation of a brand, but it just. Just because there's small guys, there's B2B, and we're talking about brands, you know, I think we'd all talk about the first round brand and others, so it's, um, brands are not just for the big and elite. It's uh, something that can be a great guy to build up your wonderful dream.